Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program at Mechanics Institute online on Zoom. We're very pleased to welcome you to White Space, Essays on Culture, Race and Writing with author Jennifer DeLeon, poet Norma Liliana Valdez, and our moderator, Sara Campos. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. And we are very pleased to co-sponsor our program tonight with Latinx in Publishing, The Mesa Refuge, The Puente Project, and Cinnamon Girl. These are four incredible programs that offer resources for writers uh, of color, of all ages and backgrounds. So we're thrilled to co-sponsor with these organizations and promote uh, writers across the country. Before we begin, I just want to say we will have a Q&A at the end, so please hold your questions and put them in the chat. And also, if you would like to purchase uh, books by our authors, White Space is available at alexanderbook.com and also at any independent bookstore near you. So. Um, we're very pleased to welcome two acclaimed writers to talk about how to forge one's identity as an immigrant in the landscape of whiteness and what it took for them to cultivate their creative potential as artists. Before we begin our program, I'd like to introduce our, our very special guests. Sara Campos is a writer, lawyer, and a program officer at a private foundation. Her work has appeared in a number of publications, including two anthologies, Basta, an anthology of Latinas and gender violence, and Wandering, The Wandering Song, Central American Writing in the US, and also another of other journals and newspapers, including Porterhouse Review, Platte Valley Review, St. Anne's Review, 550 split color lines, alternate media, and the LA Review of Books, and also the San Francisco Chronicle. She has received an Elizabeth George Foundation grant and residences, residencies and fellowships from Las Letras Latinas, also from Vona, Macondo, Hedgebrook, the Anderson Center, and the Mesa Refuge. Jennifer DeLeon is author of Don't Ask Me Where I'm From and editor of Wise Latinas, Writers on Higher Education. DeLeon has also published prose in over a dozen literary journals, including Plowshares, the Iowa Review, and the Michigan Quarterly Review, and is a Grub Street instructor and board member. She is a currently assistant professor of creative writing at Framingham State University and makes her home in the Boston area. And we're very pleased to welcome you, Jennifer, for the first time. Thank you. And with her, our poet, uh, Norma Liliana Valdez, is a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop and a Canto Mondo Fellow. And her work appears in The Rumpus, the, Sa the Los Angeles Review, Tinderbox Poetry Journal, and the anthology Latinas Struggles and Protests in 21st Century USA, among others. Norma earned her BA in Psychology, an MS in Counseling, and a graduate certificate in Ethnic Studies from the San Francisco State University. She is also an alumna of UC Berkeley Extension Writing Program and has been awarded residences and fellowships from Hedgebrook, Under the Volcano International, Community of Writers, and Vona, in addition to others. She is a founding member of the Chingonda Collective, a women's writing group whose mission is to nurture a sustaining writing practice for its members through mutual, mutual encouragement and writing retreats. And she also lives in the Bay Area. So please welcome our special guests. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Laura, and um, thank you to the Mechanics Institute for um, inviting us to put together this program. I feel really delighted to be in conversation with these two fabulous writers, to both Latinx, both women, um, both educators, essayists, although prim one is primarily a fiction writer of uh, young adult fiction, and the other one's primarily a poet. Um, although their work is distinct, I think they share common themes involving womanhood, womanhood and the immigrant experience. Um, and these are themes that I wanna to explore today um, with them. Um, their work has a lot of power and vitality. Um, and the, narr the narrators in, in both their books seek to gain agency over their circumstances, um, something that I, I truly appreciate. I'm gonna start with you, Jen. Um, I think of white space as a journey. I think of it um, both in a, in a real physical sense um, because the centerpiece of the book is this trip that you took as a young woman to Guatemala. Um, but the book is also a journey about the writerly life. Um, it's your process, you know, beginning when you're a, a, a girl, really doing, you know, taking, um, you know, keeping a journal. Um, to the point where you're, you know, you're teaching, you're mentoring other writers, other other young people. So I'd I'd love to ask you um, just how how formative that trip to Guatemala was, even if, you know, you didn't write that novel that you intended to write. Um, how did they? How did the trip inform your writing? And and uh, how you know? Tell me tell the audience about about what that meant for you. Yes, I'd love to. Um, thank you so much for, for guiding us in this uh, rich discussion that I know we're about to have. And thank you everyone for being here. I feel so welcome by the Mechanics Institute. I just want to mention briefly that I was born in Boston and grew up outside of Boston. But after college, I moved to California to the Bay Area to um, do the Teach for America program. And I taught third and fourth grade in San Jose and went to the University of San Francisco. So the Bay Area is just has a special place in my heart. I know lots of people say that, but it, it's true. Uh, white space, the essays, um, as you mentioned, are pieces where I really reflect on the white spaces that I've been a part of my whole life. Friend groups, schools, workplace, um, institutions, like college, higher education, and even the gym as a white space um, that I write about in here. But it's also about the white space of the page and how I learned to really take up space on the page, fill that white space and grow into my identity as a writer and an author. For me, going to Guatemala when I was 28 years old is absolutely at the, the crux of my development as a writer. Growing up, I heard stories about Guatemala constantly. Both my parents were born there, grew up there, and they moved to the United States when they were 18. So my sisters and I were just like doused in stories growing up. And it was always this mythical place. Like, wow, what's Guatemala? I went there for the first time when I was nine years old, and that was a very impactful trip. And we would go back and forth. But in the back of my mind, I always knew that I wanted to live there. I wanted to go there alone without the invisible leash of my parents and without their, their protection. Because every time we traveled there, we I joke, but we would go on these living room tours. We would just go from one living room to another living room to another living room. And I'm like, there's a whole country out there, you know? And my parents just, they wanted to see people, not the landscape, et cetera. So when I was 28, I was in the middle of an MFA program in creative writing. And I was familiar with school. I was good at school. I had done school. I wasn't looking for any more though. I realized after one semester in the program that what I needed to do was to fill the well, to go to the motherland, to take that roots trip and to really learn more about the history of the country, improve my Spanish and start a novel. And my parents, their response was a little surprising. 
because they actually, my father was worried. He didn't want me to go alone as a woman. He thought it was very dangerous, even though I had lived in other parts of the world, like Vietnam and Nigeria and France. And, but he, um, so he flew down a week before I arrived and he met me at the airport. And for a week, he took me to greet family members and we took, we rented a car and drove to Quetzaltenango. And during that week, he was my guide and he really introduced me to the country in a new way. I have never heard him talk as much, joke as much, share stories as much as he did that week. Um, all of which is to say that I can't imagine being a writer without having spent that time in Guatemala. And it wasn't all roses, there were some thorns, but that was part of the experience as well. And I have so much to write about. I feel like I can fill books and books with essays after that trip. But this, um, this trip really is the center of, of the book. Wonderful. I wonder if you could open that book and read to us um, from that book. Yeah, so I'll read um, a short essay called A Map of the World. When I was in ninth grade, my father ran away from home. One frostbitten New England morning, he climbed into his gray Toyota and drove toward Guatemala. He left a letter for us written in blue pen on a single sheet of my school notebook paper. Somewhere around DC, he turned back. I have always wondered how his life and mine would be different had he kept driving. His longing has haunted me ever since. It's why I am here in Guatemala, living day to day, page to page. I want to understand how my father could possibly love a country more than his family. I am sitting in a library in the Western Highlands. Tattered spines of paperbacks line the locked doors of the wooden bookshelves. Paulo Freire, Rigoberta Menchu, John Updike's Rabbit Run. The library is one room with three square wooden tables and posted on the white wall, a map of the world. It is an upside down map. North America is in the Southern hemisphere. Australia trades places with Europe. A window the size of a door places afternoon light in clean strips across the cool tiles. Outside, clouds cast shadows over the mountains. The one librarian's name is Aracelis. She is rosy cheeked and wears a pearl white sweater with a fur collar. Her black hair is thick and long like mine. She hovers over my desk, examines the black marks I have scribbled between the thin tan lines in my leather bound journal. She leans in, my shoulders tense. I have seen her before. I return to this library like I return to this country over and over. But today it's as if my face has a sign that reads, tell me your story. My father lives in the United States, in Arkansas City, and when I was three, he left Guatemala to work, but he always called and said he had gifts for us, my mother, my sister, and well, my father, for me, he was just everything, hope, a hero, until one day when it was my sister's birthday and we had the cake ready, the food, everything, and the telephone rings and it's him. All this she tells me in one long black hair of a sentence. She talks with her hands and her eyes dart left to right. She speaks as if we'd penciled this conversation in our calendar weeks ago, like she'd been practicing it while walking along the narrow cracked sidewalks in the pink light of sunrise and the orange light of sunset. So he says, look, I'm only calling to say that I have another family now. I don't love you anymore and I'm not returning. Aracelis and I both nod, me side to side and she up and down. I didn't want to say anything to my sister, so I waited until my mother asked me what was wrong. I had to tell her. My mother sat down and cried, then my grandparents, my sister, and me. Maybe he was lying, I say. Sometimes life is hard in the U.S. People can't find work. A man can feel like a failure. No, Aracelis pulls down her sweater. After that, I didn't want to have anything to do with him. Yo sufrí. I even had to go to the hospital, yes. Through the window, I spot an old man pushing a rickety wagon full of empty gas tanks. The shade from his cowboy hat hides his face. The high sun has moved its attention to another latitude, another longitude. 
Seated at the wooden table, I want to cry, not for Aracelis, not for her father, but for mine. He could not do what other men did, my father who has been homesick for 40 years. And yet a feeling of gratitude swarms me. Thank God he didn't have the guts. Thank God my father came back and that I, his daughter, can relish the warmth of both sons. That is what I felt as I listened to Aracelis that afternoon in the library when I stared long and hard at the upside down map. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. It was really beautiful. Yeah. And I'm really glad you read um, that part because it, um, it reminds me that throughout your writing, and I've, I've read um, a couple of your books and some short stories, um, you've got this theme about family separation. And I, and I think I even recall you're saying in, the, in your writing in white space that, that the issue haunts you. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, it's you know, a, a few years ago, we saw, you know, family separation in a really tragic way. And um, the kind of family separation that you're writing about is perhaps not as, you know, dramatic, but it's no less you know, you know, tragic and devastating for families. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's also the issue in your, in your book, um, Don't Ask Me Where I'm From, it's the setup for, you know, the, this girl whose father gets deported. So what is it about this issue um, for you personally and um, that compels you to write about it? And, um, and has it changed since you've become a mother? Mm. Wow, that's such a rich question. Thank you. I mean, it does haunt me. It's, um, I don't know which famous writer said this, but there's this idea that writers all have um, wounds that we return to and, and try to process um, through our writing and try to address. And I guess for me, that is a wound, you know, uh, I was young, 14 years old when, when my father just up and left um, to go to Guatemala. And what's, what's interesting is that I remember when he came back, it was just a few days later. And so maybe a week and I was getting ready to go babysit and I was downstairs and my younger sister was watching cartoons and my father came back into the house and he hadn't even taken his jacket off and he sat down on the couch and my little sister was like, Bobby, you know, and she was hugging him and the cartoons are like blaring. They're so loud. And it was the first time I'd ever seen my father cry. You know, the tears were just falling down his face and, and he was back and we never talked about it ever. You know, we didn't go to family counseling, like on TV, like none of that. We just, it was a hole under the rug that we just stepped over every single day. And I, as I grew older, I just wondered like how, I was so fascinated actually by his quest to want to go home and then by his pull of his family to come back, you know? And I think I keep writing about it because I keep turning it over and under different light, sometimes I really do feel bad for my father because he wanted so badly to go home and he didn't. And, then other days I think, how could he even consider leaving the family? You know, how, uh, how I wouldn't do that. But um, then I think about his own father and how he left his eight siblings when the, when the eighth baby had just been born, you know? I mean, stories, some of them are um, inherited, some of them are, are sort of passed on. And I think our, our job as writers is to kind of untangle some of those knots and, and make meaning from them. At least that's what I enjoy doing. That's my art form. So mm -hmm. I'll be writing about it for a while. You know, another theme that I saw running through white space um, is the straddling of cultures mm -hmm. that occurs between immigrants and their, and their children. And children often act as a bridge between mainstream culture and parents. Can you ad address that kind of navigation and, uh, and do you see that, examples of that as an educator? Yes, absolutely. This concept of being the bridge, the puente is, is very uh, prevalent. I think um, many times for children of immigrants, um, 
which is the my case, you know, both my parents, even though they became U.S. citizens and spoke English and, you know, they bought a house in a neighborhood like that was great schools, all of that, they still didn't have this fluency in the culture. And I think for my sisters and I, that's a big part of, of what we brought home. Um, some of it they accepted and some of it they didn't, you know, they were like, no, you still can't have a boyfriend and you still can't sleep over other people's houses and um but other parts they welcomed with open arms like yes you will go to college absolutely you will learn to drive you know these are these are parts of of living in the united states and um the the bridge component doesn't ever end i think i still feel like i'm i'm operating as a bridge for my parents after they've been in this country for 50 years, you know, still kind of explaining things um, or introducing them to things. But they're also a bridge for me, you know, and they are constantly um, connecting me back to their childhoods, their home country. Um, and I love that. I love that we can go back and forth. Um, I hate the idea that to assimilate means to give up, you know, where you come from or the parts mm -hmm. of your history. I mean, that's part of why I write too. I really want young people or all people, I guess, readers to see that we're not a monolith, you know, that our culture has many different um, identities and traditions. And it's, it's exciting to me to open up that window through literature. Yeah. So Norma, I, I'd like to invite you to join our conversation. And um, also at, to begin with, um, I'd love to hear and for the audience to hear your, your writing journey and how you began as you're primarily a poet, but also an essayist. Well, first of all, Sarah, Sarah, thank you so much for inviting me into this conversation. Um, first, as a, as a writer and amiga who I just have so much uh, respect for <laughs> and um, introducing me to Jen's work. My trajectory as a writer, as a poet is very, uh, it's, it's a very non-traditional path. I don't have an MFA. I was not one of those young people who at a very early age knew uh, she wanted to write. Um, I grew up in a household where um, there were three different types of books in my home. Uh, as a daughter of Mexican immigrants, and I, I want to also say that because I think it was important what Jen said about, um, I was not born in Mexico, but I was made in Mexico. <laughs> I said Mexico. Uh, my, my mother was, um, six months pregnant with me when she came to the United States um, on a tourist visa and she was already married to my father, but she came as a single person. And so when she um, got on that bus from Tijuana with my father, they sat apart. They didn't want anyone to think they were a couple because she was entering the country as a single woman and she covered her belly to cover up her pregnancy. Uh, she was afraid to enter the country and for it to be known that, you know, she was planning for me to be born in the United States. Um, all that to say that, you know, the immigrant experience that I understand is, is that through my family, through my parents, it's, it's a very strong presence that is important to me. Um, going back to my trajectory as a writer, uh, there weren't very many books in my house. There were Vanidades, which were the the Cosmo magazine, you know, in Espanol is the equivalent of Cosmo. Vanidades, there was a lot of that. My mom loved to read that. My father used to love to read um, these little cowboy Western uh, back pocket little novels that were always, that were translated into Spanish. They were originally like, like these cowboy stories. And he always had one in his back pocket. He had a closet full of these little books, which none of us could read. We were not allowed to like really read those stories. And then the third type of book was sometime when I was in like fifth or sixth grade, my parents bought an encyclopedia, <laughs> which was an investment. 
So I didn't actually realize that I really loved to read until I was in college and I discovered novels and I just could not get enough of novels. But I never saw myself as a, as a writer or much less a poet. My trajectory into, into poetry came much later in my life um, when actually in my late 30s, when I was doing a lot of personal writing, um, journaling, um, as a way to try to navigate a very difficult time in my life, which was um, uh, my youngest son was diagnosed with an incurable disease. And at that time, the only way I really knew to kind of process what I was feeling is to go into my journals and to go into my journals. And at a Puente uh, professional development uh, workshop, we happened to be sharing our writing with each other and a colleague, um, Kenneth Chacon, who is a poet from Fresno, said to me, you're, you're a poet. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And he says, yes, you are. And, and this was the first time somebody said, you should sign up for a, a poetry workshop. And I'm like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. Where can I go to do this? And this is how two years later or a year later, I ended up taking classes at UC Berkeley Extension. Um, to, uh, and, and I found one of the most amazing instructors, Laura Walker. And I've, and I've studied with, I've studied since then with many, many renowned poets, wonderful teachers. And I still go back to Laura Walker as my you know, true poetry teacher. She taught me so much about how to read and write poetry, even poetry you don't like, or you think you don't like, how can you really enter poetry, even when you think you don't like it. And so, from then, um, this new creative life force, another way to uh, understand and filter my life experience uh, came to me. And that's how I started writing poetry, you know, a little over a decade ago. Wow. So I, I'd love for you to read some of that poetry. Yes, yeah. thank you. I, I and, and we should say, you know, this is you, um, you're a published poet. Um, uh, you've got a book um, called Preparing the Body um, and uh, from Yes, Yes Books. So I hope people will run out and get it because it's yes, absolutely you. gorgeous. Thank you. And you can order it through Yes, Yes Books, which is a wonderful indie press um, based out of Portland. Um, you can also go to my website, normalilianavaldez.com, and you'll find the link to, to where to order the book. And to start off, I think I'm going to start with a poem kind of speaking to Jen, what, you know, what I resonate so much in Jen's work, which is this, oh my gosh, this desire for my motherland, which is Mexico, and um, a place I cannot really have the way I want it. <laughs> So I'm going to start with this poem titled Tepoztlan Blues. Orchids hang from the patio ceiling. When no one is watching, I will take one and put it in my pocket as if I could own something of this place. By morning, it will be dead. I'll walk by a funeral home with child-sized caskets and cry. The air will belong to firewood. Night will return cold to my bones. I'll be alebrije, half woman, half moon. On the feast of San Sebastian, fireworks rise and fall like us all. Orchestras will be spark and ash. Nothing here is tame. I am high and disoriented pulled by my entrails. I'll dance mezcal blues. His hand inside my thigh will be a hovering question. How can we do this and where? It won't be enough for the way I want to swallow this country whole. Wow. Um, the next poem I'm going to read was actually written in Tepoztlan. Tepoztlan is in the state of Morelos, and I was at Under the Volcano International, which is a wonderful writing um, residency and workshop. You can look, look them up online. And uh, I was taking a, a class with a, a renowned 
Mexican poet who shall not be named. And I read this, I am- when How I, intriguing. <laughs> when I read this poem, I invited him to attend, but I gave it to him ahead of time so he wouldn't be shocked. I didn't want him to be upset at me. Um, what to do when your renowned Mexican poetry teacher points out exactly where in your poems you sound like a tourist in Mexico. Go to the nearest taqueria and order tres de, co de costilla and a victoria. Buy a tejuana with peel in cobalt and black. Make plans with your friend Donatiu to eat mole at a stranger's house on Friday night. Check the side of a mountain and visit an Aztec pyramid. Remember you speak Chicana fluently. Remember you've shaken Dolores Huerta's hand and drunk mezcal with Sandra Cisneros. Read Gloria and Saldua again. Remember your grandfather was a bracero, which means there was not enough food. Remember your pregnant mother rode a bus for two days to get to the Tijuana border. Remember your father was deported at least once. You did not speak English when you started kindergarten. Remember you know how to clean the spines from nopales, how to palm corn into tortillas and tamales. Remember your unborn brother buried under the milpa. Remember your great grandfather, your grandmother, say their names, Nieves Ornelas. Romanita Ornelas, say your name, Norma Liliana Valdez, who you come from, Maria de los Angeles Ramirez y Juvenal Valdez, and where. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me read a couple more. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things, the other things that I'm really drawn to you, I, I was writing in this book, in a way, a, a lot of a lot of death in Mexico, the 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 narco violence that has happened in the last few years, and and there's this, you know, I'm just really for a long time was really drawn to that, and so this next poem, how to search for your child, Colinas de Santa Fe, Veracruz, Mexico. Drive a six foot metal rod into ground. With each click, click clack of hammer, dig the cross-shaped bar deeper into soil. Pull out the rod. Bring it close to your nose. Inhale. Wet earth or remains. Exhume 253 bodies, none of them yours. Yellow your skin. Grow your hair length, waist length. And this is this speaks to there's a, a group of, of mothers that started many years ago, El Colectivo Solecito in Veracruz, where the authorities were not in any kind of way helping them find their disappeared children. And um, they developed this method of um, excavate or, or looking uh, for the remains of their lost children um, when there were rumors of mass graves. Um, Okay, Sara, you, would you like me to read one more or shall we continue the conversation with Jen? What would you like to do? One quick one. Okay, quick one. No. let me read a, a, a very, very short one, which is very new, very, very new. Um, it's called Nacimiento, which means birth. Mine, the only hands my body knows. Wilderness, these thighs, these lips. Between my teeth, the grief beast moans, hopes first, snout, then eyes. Beast is how I birth myself again and again. Thank you. I, your work is so sensual and achingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I, when I read your poetry, I, I read a lot of pain. And it made me wonder, um, you know, and I asked this of both of you, like, what, what do you think it is about pain that serves as great fodder for writing? 
<laughs> you know, I, I think I will, uh, the way I want to answer this is um, poetry has been a vehicle to really filter the understanding of that pain for me, right? When I, it, it, it's, it's in some way uh, how I can make sense of these things. And uh, it, it can become for me both a filter and microscope and self-study, right? Of, of these things that I, that I am consumed by these, these, whether it's my personal pain or, or universal pain. I am feeling though <laughs> in my writing trajectory uh, I was, I have a writing mentor who I feel like, you know, my, my writing is changing. And, and he said to me, you know, you are refashioning your wounds. So I have a, a kind of what I'm really looking more towards uh, where a lot of my poems were looking more at, in a way like death, right? I'm looking more towards life and how to refashion <laughs> those wounds and to think about my writing in a different way that's where i am right now mm. i don't know what janet wants to add to that <laughs> well even your answers are so poetic <laughs> you know it's like amazing i just love 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 hearing your hearing you read your work um and there are so many common denominators of, of like our the you know themes in our work um the longing for that motherland and um i think pain what's inherent in pain is is conflict and tension and drama and that is fiction you know it's like that's the 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 kind of bread and butter of fiction in that way and so i guess it it helps to yes churn it into art and story but it's also on a practical level very uh ripe for for writing you know plot i guess in essays, it's a little bit different. It, the pain becomes more of like a hot spot in the essay that I, I kind of circle and then slowly get the courage to like approach like a fire, I guess. Um, and it's in that process of essaying, right? Like the French verb SIA means to try. Um, and that's why Montagna named the essay essay um it, it makes sense I love the essay form for that reason it's not like you start out with an answer it's it's a quest and for that reason I think I'll always write essays because sometimes there are just these situations or questions or um someone will say something in a reading and I think oh oh yes that's something I want to explore in an essay you know, I, I was doing a reading earlier this week and someone in the Q&A asked, you know, do you ever think about how your life would have turned out differently if your parents stayed in Guatemala and you were born there and you grew up there? Do you think you'd be a writer? Do you think you'd be? And um, I responded, but I, I have not stopped thinking about that question. So I'm like, oh, okay, I have to bring that to the page, bring that to the white space, you know, and just kind of see what what comes of it. So I don't know if I answered your question, but it is so fun just talking about writing. <laughs> I want to ask you both, um, you know, something that I, I, you know, this common theme, this push pull um, of, you know, mother country. Um, I read it in, the, is it Tepotzlan Blues? I, you know, that essay that you, you wrote, uh, wrote and read just now, Jen, too, about your father, it, you know, and I, I'm just wondering what you think about that in terms of the immigrant experience. Is it something we all, you know, as immigrants, children of immigrants, um, we, you know, we all, we all have it and where, you know, how does it manifest so differently in, in people? Just what, what do you think about that? Is it inherently part of the immigrant experience, I guess? That, um, and I, I guess the other question is like, what, and, and does it get passed down to kids? You know, I, I think when, when you ask this question, I think of course the phrase that is commonly used, ni de aquí, ni de allá, right? You're neither from here nor there. And, and of course we can think of Ansaldúas, Nepantla, the, 
the, the liminal space, right, that, that we inhabit. Um, one of the last few times I was in Teposla, my friend Tonatiu, who I mentioned in this poem, who is a real person, <laughs> he said to me, tu eres de aquí y de allá. You know, you are from here and from there. And that's the first time anybody had ever told me that. Um, when I think about my longing for Mexico, uh, it, it, has, it has to do with um, something that feels, you know, so unattainable, like in the way I want to experience it. Now, for the most Mexicana que yo quiera ser, as, as Mexican as I want to be, and 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 inhabit that 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 space. Um, I, I'm never really going to quite understand it. And yet, when I think about what draws me to it, it's those experiences when um, when I was a, a a little girl and my we traveled to Mexico almost every summer, um, and when I was like in elementary school and. And I remember uh, the first time I ever went horseback riding and my grandfather, I'm the oldest granddaughter, he put me on a horse and he just took me through down by the Rio and just, it, it was so different than the experience I had here in the States. And they're like, there is something else out there that is also mine mm. than what I knew here. And I think that that's always what I'm, I, I feel like there is also that something there that is mine and that I want to reach for. And I am continuously drawn to that um, because there, there is not a wholeness there, you know, to be only American. And as a, you know, light-skinned Latina, I, I, I can pass as, you know, gringa. But that is not the wholeness or my identity. So, so to me, the longing is a striving for wholeness. That's how I can speak to it. Yeah, yeah, longing for wholeness, absolutely. Um, I always think about it as like, you know, when you're when you're little, and or when I was little, I would have a sort of bedtime, you know, but I would go to sleep, and then I would sometimes like sneak out of my room and creep down the hall. And I'm like, I could hear my parents talking, laughing, eating pan dulce with their coffee every night, watching TV, maybe the phone was ringing. Like it, it was like life was still happening. And I felt like I had FOMO, <laughs> like I was missing out, <laughs> like even <laughs> as a kid. And I remember I would always tiptoe and I would just stand in the doorway. I think I was like, becoming a writer even at that age because I was like the peripheral narrator just like in the doorway looking at them and they could just be chatting dipping the pan dulce you know and I felt this like almost like a, a jealousy like I want to be in there and I feel like that's what their whole lives before I was born and their whole experiences in, in Guatemala I felt like I want to go in there I want to be in there I want to know all about it um, I want to to be the peripheral narrator for that experience or their 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 upbringing in ways that are impossible to reach that I can't I mean I can't time travel all of that but um, through stories I feel like those are those are some pathways that I'm able to go go into those spaces that I'm not allowed and I think that's what so much of it is for me I just I maybe deep down feel like I haven't been allowed to be um, Guatemalan or to be someone who can claim being Guatemalan. You know, I wasn't born there. Um, I have lived there now at this point, I can say that. Mm -hmm. but it's just like um, I write in the essays, you know, I always felt like I, I wanted to be more Guatemalan, more Latina. I just wanted more. And, um, but yeah, that's the image that comes to mind. It's just kind of like their nostalgia I was kind of wanting some of that, like a bite of that cell. But not all immigrants, of course, have those sweet memories. You know, some of them are like shutting that gate and we are not opening it. It is iron tight. Um, so that sometimes is um, important to remember. You know, it's, it's not all like we're leaving behind the beautiful countryside and coming here. It's, it's a lot of especially Guatemalan immigrants like flee violence and civil war and so much more. So, yeah. 
I want to add just a little bit more to that. This reminded me of my, my oldest son, who is 21 now. When he was in high school, he asked me, Mommy, do you think um, when people see me, do they know I'm Mexican or do they think I'm white? And I looked at him, I'm like, oh, baby, you do not look white. <laughs> <laughs> you clearly are saying in the way you carry yourself, the way you dress, that you are Mexican. And um, this to me, like, how is it that my son is also picking this up? And part of it is, is it's American society. American society has some clear racial and ethnic divisions that no matter how I look, no matter that I was born in this country, how I speak, that I am not ever going to be considered fully white American, even though I may look it. Mm. I am not, and I'm not going to be embraced by American society in that way. And so I grew up as an other, I grew up in the margins, even though I may look a certain way, uh, where I grew up, where I lived, where I work. No, there are clear divisions in this country as to who fits where. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much we would want to, I actually never have felt like, oh, I want to be white American and I want to fit in. I, that, it just has not been attractive to me, right? And so uh, I think that that's part of also that uh, identity, you know, knowing that there, you are also, and you are more, and you are whole in this other way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, riffing off that, I'll say too, that like with students, I don't know if you feel this way, Norma, like with um, students in the Puente program, but mm -hmm. now there's this generation, and there probably was before too, but I'm seeing it more now, where young people who look Latino, Latina, right? Mm -hmm. And are therefore um, judged in that way or, or, or treated in the world as such, but they inside, they, don't, they might not speak Spanish or they might not know much about the country of origin that their parents or grandparents or great grandparents are from. And so there's this um, kind of conundrum, you know, and they say like, I'm, I want to know more about my family's history and culture and language, but I'm embarrassed to ask, or I'm ashamed. Like people come up to me and talk to me in Spanish because I look like I speak Spanish. That's what they say to me, you know? Um, and they'll talk for five minutes. And then I just say like, I don't speak Spanish. And then they're like, oh, and walk away, you know? And so they're like, how do I, it's a unique intersection of being, right? Because you're being addressed and judged and stereotyped and treated for being Latinx or Latino, Latina. And then at the same time, you, you actually aren't even embracing or holding a lot of that culture and identity. Um, so it's interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen, but I think that's why we need more texts, more, more testimonials, more stories to, to pass on and, and in some cases to straight up like teach, like this is, this is what it is. Like, um, yeah, I think that it will be interesting, but I don't know, like in Puente, like are, are all the students, uh, you can't of course comment on all of them, you know, but in, in your experience working with Puente students, like do you, do you find that there's that longing to understand more about one's culture? Yes, absolutely. And, and I want to, I want to shout out Michelle Gonzalez, who's in the room and uh, in the chat, because she is one of our Puente instructors. You're at Las Positas, Michelle, I believe. Um, yes. And so uh, the Puente project is a, a transfer preparation program. There's also a high school component. It's at over 60 colleges in California over 50 high schools in the state. It's been around for over 40 years. And so uh, now expanding to Texas and Washington states, mm -hmm. co-sponsored by the University of California and the California Community Colleges. Um, I've been teaching with the students, um, oh gosh, you know, for the last 15 to 18 years of my career on and off. And so, yes, as Michelle is saying, yes, when the, the longing is real. And, you know, I've seen a shift in it, 
in in my students you know there's a lot of mexican students but now there's more central american students a lot more students who come who have come from central america as unaccompanied minors and have made their way who are now making their way into my classrooms and so um we can't as michelle says in the chat we can't be scrutinized to this monolithic lens as uh latinx peoples and so that's the experience i'm having in puente as a puente educator but for those that are like me uh, children of immigrants or maybe those who don't speak the language there there's such a longing and desire because again we live in a country that does not accept you as a whole person unless you are x a certain type of person right and so we have to seek our own survival and our wholeness mm -hmm. in many many ways through our multiple identities this being just one one slice of that pie yeah. i noticed that there are lots of uh questions in the chat and we probably should okay. transition to q a um but before we do that i'd like to um quickly say something about the sponsors uh, for this program. Um, and uh, we've talked about Puente. Um, Jen, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about Latinx in publishing. Um, and then I'll talk about Mesa and Cinnamon Girl. Um, and then yeah. we'll go to questions, OK? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Latinx in publishing is a phenomenal organization. It's a, a few years old. Um, it started with um, a group of Latinx professionals in publishing, just kind of hanging out after work, networking. And now it's grown into this 501c3. It's a wonderful organization that has um, mentorship programs, um, you know, uh, conversations on Twitter, social media, Instagram lives. And I think their main goal is to pull the curtain back on what it what it takes and what it's like to be a professional in the publishing landscape right now um, for, for Latinx people. Uh, the, the numbers of Latinx editors and agents are very low, um, abysmal. So this uh, program really helps to nurture and mentor this community so that you can not just survive in New York publishing, right, um, but thrive and really help um, pull more Latinx voices into the, the landscape. So they're, they're a great organization. Definitely check them out, Latinx and Publishing. And a couple of additional sponsors. Uh, Cinnamon Girl um, is a leadership development organization that empowers girls to be visionaries um, in our, for our world today. Uh, Cinnamon, Girls, Cinnamon Girl provides guidance and supports girls of color to prepare for college and graduate school. And finally, Mesa Refuge, um, which is a writing residency in beautiful Point Ray Station. Um, it provides solitude and space for writers who want to write uh, about social equity and the environment and social justice. And it offers its own programs as well. So check them out. Um, and finally, I just want to shout out to Macondo and Vona um, because these are writing programs. If there are um, young people or old people, <laughs> whoever is out there who wants to write um, people of color, check out these programs. Uh, Vona is Voices of Our Nation, and that's where I met Jen. Macondo is a writing program out of Texas where I met Norma and was started by Sandra Cisneros. Um, just, it's a, these are wonderful programs um, to uh, engage in, engage in writing, learn, um, and, and thrive. So I'm going to, um, give it to Laura uh, to, you know, to deal with some of the questions in the chat. Pam is going to read out oh, some of the questions. All right. Thank you. Great. Okay, we have, a, we have a question from Elaine Ellenson. As bilingual authors, how do you decide when to use Spanish in your English essays and poetry and English in your Spanish works? How do you provide enough context for readers to understand or just assume they will or should understand what goes into those word choices. Mm. I mean, I'll share that I, for me, it's there are a couple factors. One is the sound um, in the, a map of the world that I read tonight. Um, it's clear that I am speaking in Spanish with Aracelis um, in the library, and so, but the text is all in English. The dialogue. But there's a moment where she says, yo sufrí. 
And I thought about writing that in English. I suffered, but I couldn't, I couldn't commit to that. In my mind and in my heart, it's Josephi. And the sound of that is what, um, what factored into that as well. Um, other times it's, for instance, um, if, a daughter, if a mother is saying to her daughter, mija, right, which is very common, um, I, I hear it as mija, it can't be any other way. And she says literally, my daughter, pass me the ketchup or whatever it is. It's like so literal that it just is like, ah, it, it hurts my ears. So um, I make choices off that. And lastly, I'll say that um, there will be times where I think readers who don't understand Spanish might not get it entirely, but I hope that from context clues, they'll be able to from, but also there are many times where I've read words um, in French or German or, you know, peppered into the English um, landscape that I, I don't get, but I feel like I still absorb the meaning of the passage, if that makes sense. In poetry, I, well, I'll, I'll speak for myself when I use, um, I, I, I very rarely will translate. I, I speak English and Spanish. And so when I write a poem, I write it as I hear it in my head, <laughs> as it comes to me as a bilingual speaker. And so, you know, there's a poem I wrote uh, that I was thinking about the other day um, where, you know, and then he asked me, blah, 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 yes, it is, as if asking me, quien eres, right? That's how I hear it. That's how I write it. I do not italicize my Spanish. I think it's pretty clear if you're reading an English text that this next phrase is in Spanish. I don't need to italicize it for you. I'm more of a, uh, as, as a poet, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about words and the use of language and the, how they sound. And um, as Michelle, again, my uh, Puente colleague, and actually Michelle's also a writer. She's a memoirist. Uh, she's the, the author of Spit Boy Rule. Like you wanna learn about her life as a female Chicana in a punk band, uh, mm -hmm. badass. And she says, eso, eso, right? I, if you, if you, um, poetry requires a kind of engagement with it that I feel is different from prose. I feel like when I read a poem, even if it's half a page, it's, it's asking me to spend time with it. And some poems, they're so, I mean, it's going to require me to spend time with it. And if there are words in there in another language, I'm gonna Google them. It's gonna be worth it for me to look it up. And I do this often, you know, when I read uh, Vietnamese poets or African poets or um, that these other languages are in there and they are just as valid. And, and I don't feel any kind of need to translate because the, my audience is very wide. And, and I hope that if my poem engages you, you will um, spend a little bit of time with it and, and have curiosity for any words that, that might not necessarily be familiar to you. Although, you know, the, there's enough context that you'll, you'll get a feeling for it, but that's my approach to, to using in, um, Spanish in my writing and English, using both languages. We have time for one more question. Well, could you talk, um, perhaps, uh, I know you, you did mention, uh, mention it earlier, but perhaps you could talk a little more about um, how your children or younger generation are dealing with these issues. You meant, I think one of you mentioned a son who felt like, it sounded as though he felt like he was worried that he did not look Latin, he did not look, um, mm -hmm. Latino enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, is this something, is this something that is, um, that many, do you think a lot of people in the younger generation feel? Do they feel um, defensive about uh, who they are, how they identify? Do, do you want to guess that, Jim? I have some sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, our older son, older is eight years old and um when when he was 15 months we um we put him in an immersion 
Spanish immersion daycare preschool um, here in Boston. And we were so proud of this decision, right? We, we had researched the school and all the teachers were mostly Latinas and we felt like so proud. He would be immersed in this language. And um, we were surprised <laughs> because when he started, all of the, he was the only Latino boy there. All of the other kids were blonde and, and red haired and um, white. And, and it was like, oh, I didn't think about that, you know, because these were families who were really valuing Spanish as bilingual children and their, their parents were professors or doctors and used Spanish in the workplace. And they thought, we'll put our children in this Spanish immersion. So at that moment, I, I had to really think about how language is yoked to culture and identity. And I, I had, it had never crossed my mind that my son would learn Spanish in the school and not be around Latino children. Um, anyway, so that's when it kind of first came up for us. Um, he and my other son do not look alike. Um, our eight-year-old has dark skin, dark eyes, dark hair like me. Um, but our three-year-old looks like my husband, long curls, blue eyes, fair skin. And it's going to be very interesting, it already is, to see how they both um, are treated and navigate the world. And, you know, I've, I've been like looked at as my younger son's nanny, um, and but not the older one, you know, he's mine. And I'm like, they're both mine. <laughs> I was there, you know. So um, it just feels like more to write about. But I don't know what you think, Norma. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's one clear answer to that. Yeah. What is it? I can't speak for the younger generation. I mean, I know that in my, in my Fuente class, you know, students are attracted to being in the Fuente project because, you know, they want to learn about themselves. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, California has now passed, you know, ethnic studies is going to be a high school graduation requirement. The California State Universities are making ethnic studies a graduation requirement. The community colleges are as well. Why? Because our previous generations, my generation, current generation, we are still not seen. We do not see ourselves. We do not see a mirror in our educational system. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we have to create media to see ourselves. And, and I do believe that, that social media has uh, created this opportunity for content for, for everyone of any age, not just young people, because mm -hmm. who is Pastor, what's his name, who's on his roller skates? I love him. <laughs> of any age, to create content where we can see ourselves. I remember going to the library when I was in high school. I was a senior in high school and I had never read an author, a uh, uh, Latinx author. Yeah, yeah. And I went to the Richmond Public Library in Richmond, California, and I went to the section, this was teeny tiny. And I, the only reason I picked up this book was because we shared the same last name and it was Luis <laughs> Valdez, Zoot Zoot, right? <laughs> And I'm like, I don't know which book to pick of these 10. I'm just gonna go for the one that has my similar last name. I don't know where to start. Listen, as human beings, we have um, this desire to know self, to explore and understand self. And we need those mirrors. And if the mirrors are not there, we create them. And a lot of young people are doing that. Now, the dreamers movement, the undocumented students, created a very interesting narrative over, you know, 15 years ago, however long it was, mm -hmm. that they claimed Americanness mm -hmm. because claiming Americanness meant maybe we can get a Dream Act passed. Maybe, and here we are 20 years later and there still is no Dream Act. Their DACA is still in danger. Okay, mm -hmm. so our undocumented youth are still fighting to say, I belong here. I belong here. And so there's that duality in saying I belong here. That does not mean I don't also belong there. Yeah, yeah. My motherland. Yeah. 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 I love that. Both and not either or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Great. Well, uh, if there are no more questions in the chat, I just want to say this has been such a rich conversation and both of your writing is, is just gorgeous. And it's just such a, a treat and an honor to have you all with us today at Mechanics Institute. Um, we are celebrating this month, a National Hispanic Heritage Month. And I think this has just been a great way to explore identity heritage that informs us in our present moment and our, and our present selves and also moves us forward into the future. And um, this country has got a long way to go in terms of understanding and accepting the diversity that we are, that we are a country of so many different groups, heritages, and identities. And that's what makes us um, a great country as far as I'm concerned. Um, I also want to invite um, the Puente students to come to Mechanics Institute. We are, the library's open. We do have tours. And anyone that's new to us, I see a lot of new names there on the Zoom. So please look at the website. We do have uh, in-person tours of the Mechanics Institute. We have this gorgeous library, an international chess club. We have ongoing programs, some of which are on site and some still on Zoom. But we do offer free tours and we'd love to um, invite you to come and, and see us and see our website and see what other programs we have uh, for writers uh, and also for um, enjoying literature. So I want to thank um, Jennifer DeLeon from Boston and uh, Norma Liliana Valdez, who's in Oakland and uh, Sara Compos from San Francisco, who's been our wonderful moderator today and host, and all of you out there that have joined us. So thank you again, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank That's you for inviting us. Bye.